Welcome back to CodingCat.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Here is Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. Publish everywhere. Publish, publish, publish. Maybe you get like an echo machine or something going there. I'm Brittany back. <laughs> Welcome back, perfect peeps, to CodingCat.dev. Today on the show, we have Mr. Jordan Powell from Cyprus. 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 Yes. See, I wanted him to say it because I was going to be like Cyprus IO, and I was like, eh, that might not be right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't even know. Like the website's <laughs> IO, but it's technically IO, but people just know it by Cyprus. Yeah. People are always like, "What's your company name?" I'm like, Dev. But do you want the LLC or no or yes? I, what are you asking me for right now? It's always a trick. And uh, when I was at Builder, it had to be Builder.io. And I was like, okay, that's because there's a lot of Builder things out there. So that makes uh, sense. Got to get the yeah. SEO rocking, right? Yeah. Anyways, welcome, Jordan. Um, we would love to hear a little bit about your, your story. Like, how did you get into dev and how did you make your journey into Cypress? Oh, this is this is a really interesting story, actually. Um, so, I have a very untraditional path into today. Basically, I um, actually am a former pastor. My wife and I were were pastor at a church, and um, I was making no money, and I was doing like websites and things like that. I'm like, hey, I think like I could like figure out how to you know update websites and. Basically, my dad, my family ran a company, and so people would, it's a sign company. So people would come into my dad's shop and they'd be like, Hey, I need a sign. And he'd be like, Oh, get all their information. What's your phone number? You know, and they'd be like, Do you have a logo? And then, like, what's your website? And this was like, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, where like not having a website was like, you know, not the most ridiculous thing in the world. And so people would be like, Well, I don't have one. And he'd be like, And then I was like, Hmm, like, I've, so the light bulb started to go off like hey like i could probably like learn to do this make a little extra cash and so during college i was actually uh, building websites for like people that came into my uh my family's business uh <laughs> looking for a sign and you know i was you know doing them for a few hundred bucks or whatever you know i was mostly just doing it because it was fun to learn right yeah. and a couple but, hundred have you guys bucks ever watched, yeah, uh, was great have you ever watched how i met your mother where he's like Hey, this is Ted. This is like a game they play. I feel like you're just sitting there. They're like, this is Jordan. Why don't you go ahead and do the website for him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like that. And so um, so that's kind of the idea. And then eventually I was like, I actually really like this like coding thing, right? And so at some point I, I ended up starting a nonprofit. And so I still uh, fairly involved in some of the other things I am passionate about. But uh as a career, I'm like, this thing is like way more fun. Like I really enjoy it. It's, it's a lot of fun. People are way more exhausting than computers, even though computers can be exhausting. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's kind of the, uh, it's kind of my traditional path or untraditional path. But then from there I worked for an insurance company doing nothing but forms for like four years. So I could go in and out about forms and like how evil no, they are, how wonderfully uh, reactive they are and work yeah. perfectly. And I'm talking, and it's not like trivial forms. I'm talking like, if you live in this state, you're above this height, you have purple hair. Like do you get, it's like the most ridiculous logic ever. Uh, so yeah. And th cause this is like a traditional company. Like nowadays, like, you know, the insurance companies are a little bit more that they're not as picky and a lot of like the especially like the the trendier like online uh like mobile or or like uh technological insurance companies this is like an old school one where they used to like do it by hand so they're like <laughs> yeah. yeah just add another question to the form right it wasn't a big deal so anyways so then from there and then uh, i've done uh pretty much worked in the angular community for the most part over the last like six to seven years and then i've been at cypress for like the past uh, year and a half how did how did you get involved in like that Angular community? You you just like worked in it day in day out and started like putting out tutorials, talks. How did how did that go? No, so uh, I was just I was working in Angular at that insurance mm -hmm. company, and so we were building forms that sort of thing. And um, actually, I went to NGConf. It's a conference in um, 
in Salt Lake City. And and I went there sort of with some questions, like some friction points we were having, like in, in our like, you know, in building these massive forums and stuff like that. And so I went out to the conference with hoping to basically like, you know, hopefully find some sol- some answers to all my problems. Right. End up having like this sort of like, uh, I don't know, like aha moment where basically someone was giving a talk and like they were mentioning like they they were, worked in Angular and they ha- worked for an insurance company and da, 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 da. And I'm like, hmm. So I just <laughs> was like, I, I, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to talk to this person. But I'm like, let me just DM them and just see like, hey, asked a couple questions and they were like a mate, like they responded back to me to this day. I'm like really good friends with this person. But that's awesome. Anyways, through this process, they ended up getting me involved in some open source projects. And then I ended up um, becoming contributor, uh, contributing to NGRX is a uh, very popular uh, angular like state management library. So I'm like a top 10 contributor that, and basically like that connection in the angular community with that person really like got me involved in open source and then open source really like it really like um like launched my my career if you will say like yeah it's a really great place to get real life experience right you know yeah for sure is an amazing way to grow your career and going to conferences and networking with people like that it's also like huge yeah for sure and i was actually spoke there this last year and it was weird because I'm like last time because it was like the bef- last one before COVID. And I'm like, well, the last one, like I came here with problems and now I'm like speaking at it. It was like super <laughs> like this very weird, you know, experience. I believe I went to your session. Um, it, it was really good, by the way. Oh, thanks. So when I say believe, I know I did. <laughs> um, I, you got to give me some trick on uh, like how much money did you have to give to Frosty or like how did that go down? <laughs> because... I keep like I have all of my emails. I keep uh, rejections for my CFP yeah. submissions, and NGConf is just it's stacking up. I mean, five submissions this year, all rejected already. It's awesome. If it makes you feel better, I spoke there last year and I was rejected this year. So, <laughs> yeah. so I feel it, like it, like if a pastor like level of I mean talk like that's what yeah. you have to be. I, I'm out. So I don't know. <laughs> You don't work with Angular much anymore, though. Do you still want to like do something with Angular? And I, I absolutely love the Angular community. So um, Jordan knows working on NGRX. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Roberts was working um, with us at Apright for a little bit, or before yeah. I was, I should say, not for a little bit. Um, and he spoke there, and I'm like, oh, well, Apright will just be a shoe in because you know, Brandon spoke there. And then like, I realized it's Brandon. So it, yeah, there's like yeah. this whole thing at conferences where no one even to... knows where Brandon works. He's just Brandon, right? He just <laughs> does it open so. sauce now. Yeah, exactly. The pizza place. <laughs> no, it's not a pizza place, folks. It's open no. source. Um, no, but to answer your question, as far as Angular goes, I love that community. I, I really do. I feel like it's the most open, inclusive community out there. I feel like the conferences are... So solid. NGConf is amazing. Like I, I, I will go back uh, this year just to hang out with the people and you know learn some tips. But day in day out, no, I'm not writing Angular because I find it super complex these days compared to the other frameworks, and it's it's a bit frustrating. I think they know that. Like I think like okay. listening to Angular. Sure when I went to James Black Conf, I hung out with Jessica Janiak, and yeah. she's. A manager on the angular team and they're working on the like ins and outs of why the dx is not where yeah. it needs to be <laughs> it's tough i mean especially if you early on angular 2 which is angular now um with the whole modular piece and all of that switching to react i was like this is gonna be complicated again and it's like nope this is a piece of cake mm-hmm. so I can understand why it's difficult for people to get into. I still think, even though like we, we all just got state of JS back and all that and all the hate for Angular, right? But it's been around for what? Are we 12 years? I don't know. A long time now. And so I think as a, a technology, especially on the front end ages, like you're going to see that. But I do think they have some things coming out now that they've got IV all done that will really hopefully fix things with their new component style and stuff. Yeah, and with with standalone now, you don't have to do all the module work, which really, like, I never really understood the value of it when I was building the application until we you start testing and you're like, wow, like this is like when you test the with what I'm going to show you, it's like it's like so easy. I'm like, 
wow, like we have like no excuses not to test anymore. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, testing, testing's hard, isn't that? It is hard. Use? With that said, this is a perfect uh, segue. We're going to take a pause for our, our sponsors and we'll be right back with Jordan and show us some cool Cypress tricks. How in the world could I forget about this? There's no need to freak out. We have Storyblock. Robert, you're right. But we still need a plan. Okay, how much time do we have left until the launch? 24 hours. Okay, let's go. We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. That music is still good. <laughs> uh, we might have to like go back and forth with the old clip because I feel the like, old clip, that one, like was really so good. Good. it was still like everybody's bobbing their heads in the background. <laughs> it's a it's a fun new one. Uh, thank you once again, Storyblock. Really appreciate your sponsorship. Okay, Jordan. This is where the rubber hits the road. Meets the road. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna jump in. Into... So oh, you didn't tell me you're a Michigan fan. Come on. I'm, I'm a Michigan fan by marriage. I'm an Alabama fan first. Okay. All right. So you can hate me. But... I'm full. No, Michigan it's okay. Fan. I'm really not that way. But when you live in Ohio, it's like this thing. Oh, it's like embedded. If... Yeah. I'm sorry. We weren't it's supposed okay. to talk about it, guys. We can all be friends. <laughs> um <laughs> this is crazy so we're gonna dive into cypress jordan's gonna show us some cypress fun um i'm gonna say up front i've written many tests i i do end and i do unit all that fun stuff i still don't know why so if you can convince me that i need to to test better i i want this this is it like this is the story for sure. Uh, so first of all, I would say, uh, like no one wants to write tests that like provide no value to you, right? Like, like that's obviously like rule number one. It's like testing. People are always like, well, how do I know I'm testing enough? Or how do I like, how do I quantify the test? It's like, it's like, how do you quantify DevRel? It's like, well, you know <laughs> it when it's not there, right? <laughs> Can I use that for all of my KPI uh, meetings? Yeah, stuff? yeah, exactly. It's like perfect. It's like you don't need it until you need it, and at that point, it's too late, right? So uh, I would say a lot of the tests that we've, I would say for myself, we've done over the last, like as tech, like front end frameworks, especially like this, the way I skew a lot of my experience is the way they have, like we've sort of gone into this component driven development like we kind of like went all into this this like you know mantra it's like you're using react or Vue or angular or you know or like you know some of the other you know ones like that but it's like for the most part most of our compo like our applications are components right and so what ends up happening is you're like well then how do i test these components like well i guess i'll just test the like the methods of my component or something like that but then you're like it doesn't like what value is that really bringing right like right i don't know i'm not like right. i've never really i was like i'm supposed to be doing this but i don't really feel any better after i write it than when i do <laughs> and then with components it's like it's like you make a change upstream somewhere and then it's or downstream and it's like then your test fails for no reason you're like what the heck and then it's like i don't even trust them when they fail now and so so yeah so in a lot of cases like components for me have been a big uh place of frustration when it comes to testing so uh unit tests are obviously there for you as the developer to test things that are like pure like pure functions those are great use cases if you know the business uh you know business rule it's a great time to like tdd i'm not like the biggest advocate for tdd but it's like if you have a business rule where you're like given this i need the output of this thing to be this like writing the test up front is a good way for me to know I'm yeah. building this thing right. But beyond that, it's like, you're going to always get your most bang for your buck when you write an end-to-end -end test because end-to-end -end testing is covering, it's basically testing the way your users use your use your application because a lot of times we end up using, writing tests 
that think the way I do as a developer who wrote the test or wrote the code, but then are, and then, you know, you've seen all the memes where it's like, you know, uh, the UI is clear, right? And then like the user goes and like, does something something ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like that's exactly what it works, right? Users do something ridiculous and you're like, oh, I didn't think about that, right? When I was like building this method. So the that's the thing. Find a way to break your application. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's where it's like, if you can find yourself testing the way users use your application, that's, in my opinion, always going to be the most valuable because at the end of the day, they're the people that are like paying your bills, right? And you <laughs> want them to be happy. And it's also like less distru- disruptive for you, the developer, because oftentimes those tests aren't coupled to the implementation of the code itself. So that's, uh, I don't know. I didn't want to interrupt, yeah. but we had just sax on the siren stream and she like yeah. gave the perfect answer for that. And I can't remember exactly what she said, but it was like, just starting with testing is like the way that you should be creating everything. Just if you start writing the test first, like it's just starting in the beginning. And so I linked that and I'll do it maybe in my perfect pick. So I added to it my perfect pick. So it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Former, uh, she's a good friend, former yeah. colleague at Cypress. So. Yeah. Nice. Can we can we break down some uh, nomenclature? Like, what is yeah. test coverage? What does that mean? Test coverage is sort of a bogus number that's supposed to represent <laughs> confidence. Speaking um, truth. Um, it's doesn't. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but like, it can be bad when it's used as like the the finish line like i feel like test coverage is a good thing to like measure from a holistic level like does test coverage uh change over time and i guess to answer the question what test coverage actually is is basically a it's like a number to sort of uh quantify how much of your application has test coverage or test around so like if you have a a function that has uh, like an if statement in it, like an if else. It's like, uh, basically, do you have a test that, that calls this function? Check. Do you have a test that that covers the if statement? Check. Do you have one that covers the else statement? Check. So it's like, it gives you a percentage of all the parts of your application that has test coverage. And some tests, uh, the problem is, is if you have like arbitrary numbers, then Basically, you like you can hit make write really useless tests that make you look like you have really high test coverage that provide like no value. You could literally just like call the function and like have no assertions and you have high test coverage. Right. But it's not providing any value to you. So for me, the thing to always check is like, how does test coverage change? Like when you check in a big PR, does your test coverage drop really far or does it or does it improve? Like the goal is that we're always like improving it a little bit. So. But it's what honestly it something measured? I don't really pay attention to that much. Yeah. What is it measured by? Does the library like measure that for you? Or is it something you as the developer have to measure? Yeah. That, so this is uh, something that uh, some frameworks like Angular, they will, uh, and other, I don't know what other frameworks do this, but some frameworks basically like, in, it's called instrumentation. So it's basically instrumenting your test to that basically have what it needs to be able to spit out a, a test coverage report. Uh, Cypress has a plugin that you can basically instrument Cypress so that it does the same thing. Um, so I wonder how, like what it does behind the scenes, if it's like reading how many functions you have and like just. Yeah, I haven't looked at this specifically, but like essentially it, <laughs> yeah. it probably take it takes like the bundled, you know, JavaScript, right? And it's like, okay, what are all the what are all the functions or something? And yeah. what are the it basically has to be able to equate all the paths in and out of things and then mm-hmm. create some number for you. Um but yeah, I'm it's like you smarter than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should have probably asked some easier questions to start. Um, what is unit testing versus end-to-end testing? Yeah. So unit tests are things that are very, very, um, for the most part, they're tests that are trivial. They're, they're pure. They have one way in and one way out. You don't want to write unit tests are basically tests that I write as a developer to test my code. Um, not really necessarily 
for today, but for future Jordan or for future X person on my team or another team that writes some other piece of code that then breaks my piece of code or breaks something else that has an effect on my piece of code. So that's what uh, really unit tests are there is kind of like a sanity check for you. And the idea is like uh, whether they are like functions or they're like methods in a class, those are individual tests that it does this when given this basically the idea it's like there's like triple a uh, arrange your test act on your test assert your test Love so it. that's what a unit test is and an end-to-end -end test is like the complete opposite where it's like users don't care about your function they don't care about your methods they don't care about any of that stuff they just want to know when you click the button that the message appears or the modal click pops up or something like that so the idea for, of an end-to-end -end test is to test the entire system from one end to the next and back uh, the way a user does it. And that's where those tests historically were very difficult to write. Um, and so we hated writing them and we only would write them uh, for the things we absolutely yeah. <laughs> needed to have like confidence in. But tools like Cypress really came in and made like writing tests... Uh, like almost fun. Like you wanted to do it. When I saw it, I was like, that's like, this is the first time I actually wanted to go and write an end-to-end -end test after <laughs> seeing it. And uh, that's the idea is like, it's really to uh, provide a much qual like higher quality of tests without making the friction and the pain of writing tests. Like, you know, like that. So Nice. Love it. Those, those are great uh, breakdowns. Thank you for those. Now, now the rubber will hit, actually hit the road. Um, Let's let's do a little screen share, Jordan, and show them all about Cypress and how we can do some of this stuff. Sure. Not that Not screen. That. <laughs> Wrong screen. That's later. Ah, yes. So here is a project using, uh, we'll use Angular since we were just talking about Angular and uh, you're talking about how painful it was to use. So I'll show you how easy it <laughs> oh, is to use. Hey, I'll never get anybody on again. Come on. <laughs> Uh, so we're just going to, uh, well, first of all, I'll serve the application so you can see what it looks like here. Uh, oh, I should probably run npm install. That's a good idea. Shouldn't take long. Shouldn't I just like long. changed my, I should, yeah, I'm I know. I took the four npm runs. <laughs> yeah. We got another commercial we can run. Uh, that's <laughs> um, I, I have many. I, I make this funny. Well, it's not funny. It's the name of the. So I use PMPM and it's the performant okay. node package manager. Ah. It's that's its name, but it's it is faster. Okay. Did I tell so you I aliased PMPM on my machine? I only yeah. type P. I, I can't. I can't do the four it's letter. Just, it's just really hard. Yeah. Firebase. I alias to F. There's just things that you do. App right A. I mean, it's all yeah. good. Nice. So anyways, this is the super simple app. Basically you log in, it's just a login like form essentially, right? Uh, some, something super simple. Uh, that's basically what the app does. Nothing super crazy, but in order to add Cypress to your app, all you gotta do is npm install back to npm and we will let this run its magic and Perfect. So now at this point, Cypress is installed and all you need to do to launch Cypress, hopefully you can see that, is MPX Cypress open. And this will launch Cypress. Uh, Cypress, you can run headlessly like in your terminal or like when you're running uh, in CI or something. But for the most part, when you're writing tests and developing tests, like using the actual uh, open uh, mode of Cypress is going to be way better. Um, Let's do maybe but, a brief introduction of like what is Cypress and how does it different than other testing libraries too? Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I was just getting ready to talk about is okay. so Cypress, <laughs> Cypress is fundamentally different than other uh, like 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 end-to-end -end testing frameworks or basically browser testing because um, things like Selenium or Playwright, those those uh, testing software basically live outside the browser. And basically what they do is they send messages to the browser that say do X, Y, and Z. And then the browser's like, okay, I'll tell the application to do X, Y, and Z. 
Um, but it's a little bit like, and there's there are some advantages to that because you can uh, you can do things faster uh, in some ways like that. But there are a lot of disadvantages to that. Do you guys remember the? Um, uh, well, first of all, the Cypress lives actually in the browser, and and so that's the fundamental difference between Cypress and pretty much everyone else. But I like to equate it to like, do you guys remember the game as a kid where you were playing? It was like telephone, right? Where you you tell a message to someone and then they're like, yeah. they interpret it and then tell it to the next. It's kind of like the same thing. And it's not that like, you know, Selenium and, and Playwright and people don't do a good job of converting those messages. But I like to say it like, like those testing frameworks automate your browser where Cypress is in the browser with your application. So it really automates your application itself. So there are some advantages uh, to that. Um, so in this case, we could configure end-to-end -end or component testing. Um, we can do end-to-end -end testing. We could do component testing. But in either case, uh, Cypress has a wizard that will just do this for you. So it's super easy. At this point, Cypress um, doesn't, it doesn't um, like Playwright and other browsers ship with the actual, uh, and Selenium ship with the actual uh, uh, like uh, browser drivers, but Cypress actually depends upon your machine. So basically it'll detect, hey, your machine has Canary and Chrome and Electron and Firefox. So it'll be like, which one do you want to run your application in? So in this case, we can run whatever, do Chrome. And when you're doing this like through CI headless, you're picking those or? So it it'll, it'll default um, to Electron headlessly, but you can, um, there's a flag so you could tell it to run in mm. Firefox or Chrome cool. or, or whatever, something like that. So this case is going to say, hey, you don't have any tests written. Uh, so we can either tell it to scaffold some example uh, specs, which we could do. And we could just go ahead and do this. And at this point, we have a lot of example apps, uh, example this tests. This awesome GUI like, to get started. Well, that's nice. And so at this point, it's going to just visit an example app. And it's just going to run. It's like it's to do MVC app. Yeah, I know. Every app, right? Like. <laughs> So at this point, like, but the cool thing about Cypress is because you're in the browser, like you get a much richer developer experience when you're writing your tests. It's way easier to figure out what's happening, what's not happening. And so, for example, you can say, okay, you could see this is like a real browser, right? And you could, um, you know, well, didn't mean to click that, but you could like um, go to your, like we have a console, you have all your elements, you have uh, like, your network tab. So as you know, tests run, you could see all the network traffic happening, you know, console logs being, so you get like all the things you're used to using as a developer directly in inside of the browser, which is great. But then you also get like this time travel. So you can like go through and see what's happening like along the way, if you're typing things in, if you know, deleting things, you get this like snapshot in time, which is really, really cool. And this becomes the test programmatically as well, or? So there is a way. Um, so this was basically a bunch of, I can show you uh, what we created was, not that, uh, let's just go, there we go. Uh, basically that scaffolding basically put inside of this ETO folder, or when we installed Cypress, basically has a Cypress folder, and then there's an ETO folder, and then there's like this getting started, which is this to do, um tests and these are the tests that it's actually that it actually wrote for us um okay. but there is um we do have uh something called cypress studio which does there's an experimental flag you have to turn on but basically it does allow you to basically on the fly like visit a url and then start like typing in and it uh, generates the test for you while you're navigating which is pretty pretty cool that's really cool uh, so at this point, these are like not these, these tests are just generated. So you can see examples of like how to do it, but in showing you like different ways to do, handle like a lot of common things you might find yourself doing, but these tests are not valuable at all to like our actual application, right? Like they're not, uh, they have nothing to do with like what we actually, um, like our, our specific login form. So we can go ahead and delete these for now. We could create a new one. We could call it whatever login .js. And if we wanted to, it's pretty easy to get like, 
get started if you've ever written any so type of test before. To doing the dot cy that is that a requirement or just a convention so this is uh there is a a default spec pattern that cypress uses um dot sci.js with 10 with version cypress 10 and old uh beyond we changed it, it used to be dot like a dot spec by default but uh something i'll show in a second with component testing is uh, those tests actually, instead of living in this end-to-end -end folder inside of Cypress, we'll actually put component tests next to the components. And mm -hmm. we realize like some people might have spec files for like Jest or other things that they want to keep. So that's why we kind of switched to by default uh, .sci uh, as a like a, a specific spec pattern we're looking for. But you can easily change that um, in, you know, inside of any of these specifically um just by clicking on this spec pattern so you could just say hey i'm gonna do you know dot spec dot ts or js or you know whatever you wanted to here and then that's what cypress will use to pick those up so if we wanted just to write like a really quick uh you know test i, I don't i don't know if you guys want to spend time writing into a test you want me to show a uh, component testing but for the most part, uh, you know, writing tests is pretty straightforward. So what, what do you want is to do? Is there any IntelliSense or VS Code or things that help you? Like one of the things that I struggle with in testing libraries is figuring out the verbiage, right? Like what yeah. that library calls something. So is there something that helps with that? Yeah. So I would say um, it's a good question. So let me just say we can log in or something, whatever. We'll just create a test. So Cypress, for the most part, um, sci we're not using uh, TypeScript, so that's going to be a big uh, bummer for us. But if we were using TypeScript, um, this would be much simpler. We could change that. But the idea is like there's, there is like there is uh, typing that you get when you're using type, TypeScript that tells you, like gives you the IntelliSense you're looking for. Um, so I'm just wondering, that like, answers your question. Describe it, like all the methods that you're using, like you're familiar with it, but someone that's coming into Cypress is not familiar with like what the, that library calls it. And I know just yeah. different and they're all like just a little different. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, for the most part, Cypress just wraps Mocha. So if you've used Mocha, which is like similar to Jest or Karma, or other things like that, they're all fairly similar in this way. And then Cypress uh, kind of wraps those frameworks. So um, there are um, a good place to start is at Cypress Studio where, it's, where it starts creating tests for you. And then you can use those as either a good way to start seeing how those work, or you could also use those example specs that we created so you could go in and be like okay this is I'm how you sure do x y and z that says yeah there's a lot of documentation <laughs> so um yeah i don't know if we want to spend like a lot of like a ton of time going through that stuff but there's another option we could do too beyond end-to-end -end testing and with end-to-end -end testing you're visiting the website and like a, by a url and then you're interacting with it with um there's also another type of testing called component testing, which is some the something that I've been like really, really excited about, especially for the uh, Angular users, because this is like a really, really easy and great to use uh, compared to, uh, you know, pretty much other testing solutions out there. Yeah. But what let's, is going to dive into that? Yeah. So I would say one of the differences with like end-to-end -end testing is it makes the assumption of like, you have a dev server that has your website hosted somewhere. So whether that's google.com, some local host, some uh, wow. dev server, test server, it depends upon another server serving your application or component testing. It's coupled to the actual frameworks themselves. So we actually ship with a dev server that, you know, you actually, that you essentially mount those components in. So in this case, we have support for Angular, uh, create React app, Next, Nux, React, Felt, Vue, wow. all the flavors of Vue. So we have all these flavors. Uh, in this case, uh, most cases, it's going to be able to detect from your package.json like what framework you are using. So in this case, it's like, hey, you're using Angular. Um, at this point, it'll tell you what dependencies are needed. There may be cases where you need to install 
additional dependencies. But in our case, everything's already set up for us. And again, it will handle all the scaffolding of everything While we need to. Visualizing this too, I have one quick question on the end-to-end -end testing. Does it do any visual testing at all, or is it purely just code related? Like interaction. What do you mean? Like, uh, does it, is it able to do visual, like, um, checking to make sure that things are visually accurate? Like CSS is pixel, accurate. pixel perfect type stuff. Y yes, because that's the, the one main difference between, um, like, like testing library or things like that is like, you're using a virtual DOM to basically mount your components or visit uh, you know, something where Cypress is actually in the browser. So not only can you visually like as a human look at it and see, but you can, you could actually validate that this thing is actually visible in the DOM and not just like it's, it's in the DOM, but it's actually visible in the DOM. You could do things like that. You can make sure it has a certain right classes, uh, all that type of stuff, the right, uh, you can write uh, tests that like would visually test the application. Gotcha. Exactly. And so that's that's the main benefit with like because you're in the browser, there are some trade offs. It's a little slower, uh, some things like that. But in my opinion, if I'm going to write into and test, like I want the most like the most thing I can get. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, we could go ahead. Um, this is done configuring. We can go ahead and it's going to say, hey, you don't have any tests written. That's because it's now looking we're running in the component mode. So it's looking for component tests and not us. Uh, uh, not end-to-end -end tests. So if we go back, we can go to our app and we have an app component and then we have a button and a button is a good place to start. So we could do button, we could just create it. So button.component.side.ts, we're gonna use that same, um, the same uh, suffix and everything we did before. And we're gonna do the same, uh, way we wrote our test before. So that's the other thing. If you're familiar with end-to-end -end testing with Cypress, it's really easy to get started with component testing because same tooling, same uh, same API. There's only one difference and that's this next part. So first thing we want to make sure our button can actually like mount on the DOM. So we're just going to do Cypress side at mount. And here's where you get some of this type of head we were talking about. In this case, we want to mount this button component and we're gonna import that button component from here. We're gonna save this. Now go here, Cypress automatically detected. Hey, wow. I see this button. And then I can go ahead and mount this. And so now we now have our button in here. Now it doesn't look that exciting because <laughs> this button uses, uh, it uses content projection. So it's kind of like the way in React you it's like a child, basically, that type of thing. So basically, whatever I put inside of this button will uh, essentially render. Now, if this were, for example, React, this would be really easy. You could do something like it can mount, and you would just do side up mount, and you would do like button component, and you would just do, you know, hello, you know, something like this. Sure. Yeah. Like that's all you have to do. So there's, uh, you can also use in an Angular world, you can also pass it a string, which is the, the basically the template that you would pass. So you could do something like this and do hello and app button. And there is one other caveat. The second argument of, um, there is a second argument to the mount, which is a configuration. So this has things like if you're if you are done Angular testing, there's things like import, which are like the things that uh, like they're modules. In our case, with standalone components are modules, which is a little confusing. So <laughs> because because uh, this is to part to the thing you were talking about earlier, but uh, the idea is like when we mount like this using this class syntax. Um, we can under the hood in the Cypress mount, we can basically do all this for you. So you don't have to worry about doing this. But when you're passing the string, like we don't know what the actual like original artifact is. So you have to pass it. So in this case, if we do this, so now our button says hello. And 
the cool thing is like this is like a real button i can interact with it i can actually click it uh that type of thing right and so this button also has like an on-click handler so if you click it it fires an event up so we could easily like write a test um we could say it can it dispatches an event emitter when clicked and i can do side up mount and i'm going to just use this syntax because it's a little easier for now um because well there's well we could do several different ways but uh i don't really care what it says in the middle right but there's a couple ways we could do this one is we could um do something like this so the component the component uh, in cypress everything is like a promise it's not exactly a promise and people get confused by that so but it's like a promise so i can then chain off of this component so it yields basically like itself um so what it yields is there's something called a response and it has the component uh so you have access to the component uh everything in the component like the on click handler like we just talked about or you have the uh access to it's fixture, which is something used for testing. And this is something if you've done testing with Cyp or with Angular before, you'd be very familiar with. But in this case, we need to uh, create a spy, which spies are basically a way for our test to say, hey, I want to know when you click, when you do something, like whether this method gets called or you click this button. Basically like, hey, I'm going to listen to this and then I'm going to report back when like the listening. thing you told me. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, um, we want to uh, do response at component dot on click. I like spy on better. Oh, can we rename the JavaScript method to spy? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. So the idea is like we want to spy on this on click method, and it has uh, it's this has an uh, emit method inside of it, and then what we can do is we can then give this an alias, so we could say like. Uh, my super secret spy. We could like give it a name and then we could be like, hey, I actually want to like, I want to actually click the button now, right? Like that's the thing I want to test. So with Cypress, the thing that like is one of my favorite things of Cypress of, of all the things is that the API is like super, super easy. So like, uh, like with uh protractor or testing library like there's all these different ways you select by different types of things cypress basically uses like jquery under the hood so you can just use uh like html attributes so i could say hey get the button right or i could say get the button that has like my button id or i could use like wow. my button class uh or you could do like data attributes so you could do like really cool things and to end testing, there's like certain the or get ID or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so there's like certain you don't have to remember all the APIs. You just do get and and just it's like how you would normally write CSS or something like that. So at this point, when you're doing component testing, uh, it's like you're most of the time doing something pretty small. So it's just a, just give me the button. Like I don't need to like really narrow it down any further than that. So at this point, I can say click, and I want to then get my ali uh, my spy and I can basically reference this spy by this at sign so anytime you have a spy it's basically saying hey uh, I'm calling an alias with the name of whatever you put after it and then I could do should and here's your type of head and I should say should have been called run save rerun or Cypress automatically that, reruns, and there you go. Have dot been dot called in quotes that string was that something yeah. Cypress? Or? Yeah, this is like something Cypress. It's like should have been called, so it's a little bit like more human readable than like. Uh, it's human like, readable, but it's weird. It's in a string to me. Yeah, it's like magic streams, but they're they're strongly typed, so it's okay. people get confused by it. So like you can should have been called with. So you have like all these are strongly yeah, typed. This is yeah. so I would think that it would have been camel cased on like the yeah, function, it's, but it's yeah. This is this is like something people people are like I hate this about Cypress or I like it. You know, it's kind of <laughs> one of those things, right? But the idea is, you know, it's really easy to write this test, right? So just to like 
back up through that entire example. Um, can, you, can you open that code up one more time? So yeah, for sure. Essentially on this, what, what you're doing is you're mounting the button. You're saying, it. let's, let's spy on the on click. We actually fire the click, and then it says, I should have seen it be fired. Yes. Okay. And, and like, maybe that button had like a value that got called when you clicked it. Like maybe it, it incremented some count and that number is supposed to have been passed up to the parent. I could have said been called with five or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Or four. That's, that so was, if I click, I was curious. so if I press this, it's going to fail because it's like, Hey, it was called, but it wasn't called with, you know, with the argument of four. Right. Uh, but in this case, gotcha. the only requirement of the button is that it was called because that's the, the requirement, right? Yep. Yeah. And so this this always gets back to my like, yeah, you can have 100 percent code coverage of stuff you just don't need. <laughs> like it's it's kind of hilarious. So that's 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 getting back to the coverage concept. So it's it's very tough. This is this is why I think testing is it's an art. It's not a science. Mm. I, I think there's a lot of human aspect that goes into it. Um, I think many companies, when they run into situations where an error occurred, they will put it immediately into their end-to-end -end testing so it doesn't happen again. Um, mm. Some companies don't do any testing and only do it that way. I don't know that I would recommend that, but like, make sure you're hitting tests that you believe uh, you, you should have at the beginning at least. Yeah. And, and like, this is a pretty trivial example. It's a button, right? Yeah. And the cool thing though, is like, this is way more valuable of feedback than like a, a dot in a, in a terminal, right? That's like, well, I guess it passed, but it's like, you can actually see these actually running and you see it and you can interact with it. And it gives you like a better sense of confidence because it's actually running in a browser and it'll mimic the behaviors of your users. Um, but if we were to like, uh, write one more test quick is we could do something a little bit more complex where it's a little bit more valuable and closer to like a core behavior of a of a user. So we could actually write a test for the actual app component itself, which is like basically the highest level component that gets mounted when you, it's almost like we could do an end-to-end -end test at, at this point, but we're using components because we're just going to mount the this component. So we go back to, uh, well, I don't want to do that back to this sort of thing app components and there are there are snippets you can install that like give you all this like really really quickly um but uh let's see side up mount and i could do app component and i could press save and as you can see it's already found here and boom so here the really cool thing is is actually when you, component testing, in my opinion, is the most valuable when you're actually building your application and your components themselves. Because it's like, I can put this like to the to the side. If my thing will stop pop popping up. I could like put this to the side, um, and I could like you know be working side by side, making changes to this. Um, in fact, I could like go to the styles here, and I could be like, you know, uh, what's this guy? This button. You know, the button needs to be like a uh, background of like red or something like that. Like I could go and I could be like, well, this should work. And so oh, there's the, my background. My button just changed from blue to red. Oh, that's way too. That's ugly. I don't like that. Right. So you get this like um, very quick feedback loop where you're saving and you're seeing like immediate uh, response back. That is much more valuable than like, again, a terminal response back. This is like a visual thing that as you're building it so it's kind of like storybook met with like unit testing that type yeah. of thing so that's kind of one of the things i like about it but in this case like we could do something more complex just beyond mounting right like we could do mm -hmm. something like uh in this case when you get like a 200 the app basically shows a welcome component it's like hey welcome user so and so uh so we could like write a test like that so you're checking like, on like api responses and things like that at that point yeah, exactly. So cool. we could say should redirect to welcome screen uh, when creds are correct. And so we could do just mount our components. Uh, and then we could say we can do something like sci dot um, contains. We want to say I want to get the username with this and I want to um, I want to find its input and then I want to type 
test user. And I could save and you'll see this rerun and you'll see it type test user right there. I could do basically the same thing here, but instead of username, I want to get the one that says password and I want to say uh, password one, two, three, which we won't see because it's masked out, but there you go. And so here we can, we could actually at this point, if uh, because again, this is just running in a browser, I could go ahead and click, if I open my network tab, I could click login and you're going to see it made API request and it's failing because I don't have a server running. It's just <laughs> running in the browser, right? Um, but if I, we can use something in Cypress called Sci Intercept, which is basically a way to intercept requests at, in the browser. Again, a benefit of being in the browser. I don't have to like create a mock or some spy or like all that stuff we hate doing. Like when we're writing tests, we could just write a, a intercept and basically say like, hey, I want to spy on a post request to that auth endpoint. And instead of like actually making the request, it's kind of like, it's kind of like stop you in your tracks and basically give the response back. So I'm going to say, hey, I want to return it to a, a 200 and I'm going to give the body and say like, maybe the body has like a status, maybe it has like a message and we could say, hey, you're authenticated, something like that. So now um, this will not do anything differently because uh, we never clicked on anything. We just basically establish the intercept but if we now go to side at get a button we could make sure the button says login and we could click it and now if we click this let me we'll now see we call it an off endpoint here hopefully you can see this and we're getting a 200 and the preview is returning exactly what wow. we set up that's really so cool. it's really cool and now we see welcome test user so now it's like hey I want to make sure that our DOM contains this after we've clicked all this. This is like a really easy way where it's like I'm adding actually useful, like like this would be really difficult to test using a unit test. It'd be yeah. difficult to do, not difficult to do with an end-to-end -end test, but maybe I have to stand up an API and like what are the right user credentials and like all that type of stuff. Or here I'm just like, I really just want to make sure my my front end components like play nicely together, right? So that's kind of the cool thing about doing this approach. I, I should know this. And uh, how many frameworks are supported? Is it all of the standard front end frameworks um, for component there... testing? Yeah. So <laughs> when we set when we set up originally, we uh, it it walked it through that, but it was Angular, uh, React, and then and Vue and Svelte. But then like within those, there's like Create React App, sure. uh, yep. you know, Next, and then. View and Nuxt and like all the meta, all the meta flavors and, yeah, <laughs> all the metas. When are we going to get solid and quick? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like all the new. It's all JavaScript. That should yeah. be easy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we are working on like ways, uh, like a standard adapter, so people could very easily create their own, uh, yeah. like adapt adapter plugins to support those types of things. But uh, yeah, this is like really cool because I feel like this is like. You can't make testing like really any easier than this from like what I've ever, from my experience. So I think you could add really valuable tests with like very little, very little effort. And, and I think it's pretty cool. So, so when are you guys going to implement that open AI thing and it'll just do all this for me? <laughs> yeah, we're definitely looking okay. into it for sure. I, I think that, uh, you know, AI will definitely pr most likely hit areas like testing first because like, those are the things we don't want to do anyways. So we're like, hey, if we could just like get someone else, a machine to do it, then that's better, right? Yeah. Have you tried uh, Copilot with Cypress? Like, does it do well with? Yeah, there are certain things that definitely holds up pretty well with. Um, but it, a lot of it, it, again, it's predicated upon like your ability to communicate like requirements and things like that. Like, where it's learn like from Google, Google Foo, but it's like Copilot Foo now. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be definitely be interesting to see over the next, you know, like three to five years, like how how the testing area like landscape shifts and stuff. But I think that uh, we're at least at a place now where it's like even if you have the right test, they're at least like not miserable, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I think that's uh, that's a good overview of Cyprus.
we're going to now jump into something we like to call our perfect picks of the week. Um, <laughs> this one kind of blows away all of our picks probably ever, Britt. So we're going <laughs> to let Jordan go first. Uh, so this is something I've been saving for like 20 years for. But uh, basically, <laughs> this is a base that I've been wanting for a really long time. It is a Ernie Ball Music Man Stingray uh, uh, five string with the double humbuckers. I actually bought a Ernie Ball four string sim- single humbucker uh, back when I was in high school. It was like, you know, shoot, like 15 years ago, over 15 years ago. And I've played that thing like every week. Like it's got the, the neck is messed up. It's got scratches all in the back. Like it's like my baby. It's the thing like I will never sell, but uh, <laughs> I've always wanted the five string. And so I finally was able to uh, save up and, and pull the trigger. So I'm actually leaving tomorrow or saturday to a couple days to go pick pick it up so i'm really excited about this so. that's oh, awesome you don't even get it shipped to you you got to go like hand well i could but uh there's i know if you for sure if you're familiar with it there's a store called sweetwater which yeah. is like it is like the disney world for musicians and it's like an hour and a half from my house so i'm like ah it's like an excuse like i need to go and pick it up right you know that's where i got some yeah. of my audio equipment from yeah you get to nerd I, out. I didn't go one. pick it up though. They shipped it to me. Yeah, you can like <laughs> yeah, lose like, track of time real quick there. It's like an IKEA for. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's awesome. Brittany's had a little downtime, so her pick is. Oh my gosh! Fun. Yeah, I've spent the last two weeks playing a lot of Minecraft, but we started watching New Amsterdam, and it's it's been pretty good. It pulls at your heartstrings. I swear, I'm crying by the end of every episode, which is I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but it's been watchable which is i don't know when you've watched most of netflix and you find a good show again you're like Woo. oh it's on netflix it oh yes it's on netflix nice. now i, I watched like the first season or like some of the first season i never really got into it maybe i'll uh, pick that back up yeah it's been pretty good cool it, it's hard to watch with a doctor in the family because he complains about <laughs> the medicine all the time <laughs> oh man that's that's fun. That's like watching hackers with us. Like that's yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they're typing nonsense in the <laughs> My pick, which I should have uh logged Oh, I had out. two more picks in there. Did you just skip them? Oh. Sorry. I, I didn't even see your other picks. My bad. Um I, I guess we better uh, do yours next. Just one second. Yeah, Hang on. Hold on. Just... No, no. Let's do this. <laughs> this one, this one just opens the Discord, so oh yeah. And so just the link is going to be really hard. Um, the link is going to the invite for this Friday, but now weekly in the Spelt Discord, we're going to have maybe the other the link oh. to the Discord would be better. Um, weekly this week in Spelt and um, E Train is a user that is in the community Enrico on Twitter. Enrico, I don't remember the last part of it, but uh, he's going to be running it and just going a review in what happened this week in Svelte. So that's going to be a fun thing. I will get the right link to the Discord. It's svelte.dev slash chat is to join the Svelte Discord. And then my other pick was the Svelte Sirens testing in Svelte with Jess Sachs that I mentioned earlier in the stream. And this was just a great overview of Cypress and Svelte and it was fun. Very cool. Testing in Svelte. Very, very relevant, apparently, too. Yes. Uh, my first pick, and it's still... I, I've been trying to reverse engineer this thing. It, it blows my mind. So um, it's called Scrimba, and it's a, another way to learn. And we've been talking about, like, should we add the free code camp style to Coding Cats? Should we do... And then Scrimba, like, came out. I'm like... And I, I was like, yeah, well, you could do this. And then I, I'm like, I can do that. I've never heard of it. And then you looked at it and you're like, what is this? And yeah. then apparently they write their own framework for it. So, yeah. So Scrimba is, is written on top of Imba. Uh, here we go. Built with Imba. Um, it's kind of wild because it is actually, um, it's just memoized DOM, not a um, virtual DOM. So it's, it's crazy fast. Um, what I've been finding out in my reverse engineering of how the heck this thing works is they kind of need some of that for their recording features that they add. So 
Okay. What the recording does, which is why I was logged in at one point. Let's try this again. The cool part about this. So um, let me just go to like a scrim. Uh, that's not going to be good. Let's go into React JavaScript. Here we go. Okay. So if you're in here um, and you want to learn something, when you hit the play button, notice how it follows like this. This is editable code, but yet as I move it, it types it out and follows the cursor all at the same time. And it's just like updating the DOM for every event. Yeah, which is crazy. I finally figured out how to do all of this, but it's not perfect. I don't love it. Um, so we'll see. I might I might keep working on this, uh, you know, at midnight when I'm can't think straight. They have videos anymore. that come in sometimes and then the, they'll play down in the corner, but you can move it and maximize it. And then they have like a browser that's in there that you can move around. It's just an insane amount of events happening and it's all fast. And they said it's uh, less megabytes than a video would be. Yeah. And so I find a lot of their videos, um, what's actually happening is they're embedding Google Slides uh, and they pull in like SPGs and all this fun stuff. So that's what this piece does. Um, from what I've picked up so far. And then the the DOM recording. Like, I have all the parts and pieces. Connecting them together is kind of what makes Scrimba so great. So very cool tool. Um, if you're just looking for a learning resource and not nerding out on the tech like I have been, um, it's a wonderful place to actually learn and use um, their courses and things like that. So definitely check it out. Um, they do have a, a path for teaching too. So if you're interested in that, they have this link down here called the teacher talent program. Check that out too. And you use their system to like, yeah, you use their system to do the recording, which is yeah. just. It's really cool. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. My second pick as if <laughs> Grimba wasn't enough, this passed by and I just <laughs> like, I have to pick it. I don't even know what it is. So this is called uh nut. It's, so it's ridiculous by the way. That's um, nice. And what, what this is, is kind of like another Electron-ish thing, I believe. Oh, really? interesting. Why is there paid versions? What is that? I don't know. Literally, it just came across in the Node.js daily or weekly weekly update. And I was like, huh. Mm -hmm. So it says desktop automation. So I'm kind of curious about that. But open um, So I just wanted to be able to say there's nut.js <laughs> on a podcast. And... Um, Weird, very weird. I don't That's know about good. naming things. All right. Jordan, thank you so much. After I got him laughing, that was perfect. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, showing us Cypress, and honestly, just testing in general. I find as a developer, we love all the fun parts, and testing's not one of those. So anything that we can do to alleviate that really is awesome. Totally. All right, we'll catch you next time. See ya. Later.